Just know that anytime it's going crazy on Wednesday and the weather, not necessarily the weather, but the roads, if the roads are really crummy, I start sending out texts to kind of our, our regular crew on Wednesday night to find out who's going to be here and who's not. If the majority of the folks aren't coming, then I just start sending out the, the message that, because um, I don't like to do the study if, if the majority of the folks are gone, because I think the value is being together. So um, if we didn't get you, if we didn't send a message to you last week, it's because we either forgot. <laughs> How do we forget Scott? Oh my goodness. Or we just, we just didn't have your info. And so I apologize for that if we, you know, s- some of you came here and saw the parking lot empty and figured it out, but we really try hard to to avoid that. So we do always post it on Facebook. If you're not a Facebooker, maybe find a friend that is a Facebooker and jump on the church. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really uh, stretching you there, Scotty. But anyway, um, I want to go through the first four um, proofs of a pre-trib rapture that we've been talking about, just to give us a refresher. So Greg is going to get us lined out there. And we'll see how much you guys remember. So we went way, way, way in depth on this one. So the, the first proof, and I think in my personal opinion, this is the most important. I think it is kind of the, the big picture of uh, why I believe in a pre-trib rapture. God has not appointed his bride, his children, to suffer the outpouring of his wrath in the tribulation period or ever. The pre-trib is the only view that accurately represents the character, nature of God as it relates to his bride or his children. So that's a hugely significant issue that you have to work through if you're going to hold a mid or a post-trib view because as you study Revelation, particularly the, the tribulation period 6 through 19, it's clear immediately in the tribulation period that it's the outpouring of the wrath of God. And so we listed a number of scripture references that deal with that, that talk about um, we have not been appointed to suffer the wrath of God as his children, as his bride. If, If that did apply to us, if we were subject to the wrath of God for any reason as his bride or his kids, then we have to go back to the cross and say, what wasn't accomplished there? Because if that didn't deal with the wrath of God, then... And we're in trouble. So that is a, is a hugely significant issue that you got to work, work through from the beginning. Second, I think this is our Ecclesia, proof number two. Greg, proof number two. Come on, baby. It could be my issue, too. Maybe I didn't get my slides correct. There it is. Yeah, yeah. So as you study the tribulation period in Revelation 6 through 19, you never one time see mention of the word ecclesia. And that is hugely significant because all through the New Testament, that word ecclesia, ek meaning out and kaleo meaning called out, literally the church is referred to throughout the New Testament as the called out ones. Called out of sin, called out of the world, called out of death, called out of slavery, called out of darkness, all kinds of things that we're called out of, and ultimately we will be called out of this world. So you have to come to terms with that if you're a mid or a post trib person. You have to be able to, to answer why the church wouldn't be mentioned at all in the tribulation period, because the church is mentioned, Ecclesia is mentioned all throughout the New Testament, and they're just mysteriously not there, they're gone. There, as we're going to talk about tonight, there will be believers, of course, in the tribulation. There will be people who understand the message of the gospel. There will be people who get born again. Interestingly, when you read through Revelation 6 through 19 about those people, and this is maybe an um, extra credit assignment, read through the tribulation period and specifically pay attention to what those believers are referred to or called, those who get saved during that period. Really, really interesting. And I think that will help you further understand why the church isn't mentioned there, because they, those who get saved during the tribulation, are referred to as something 
entirely different than we as the church or the bride. You still with me? Okay, so that's an important one there. The next, Jeremiah 30. So in our last study, we talked about this one as well as the next slide that we're going to see. Don't turn there yet, but Jeremiah 30, 1 through 7. So the Bible clearly talks about the tribulation period being the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another name for Israel. And then, of course, Daniel um, chapter 9, we studied in our last study the prophecy of the 77s, the 70 periods of 70 years, okay? So the first 69 sevens started when king, anyone remember? Artaxerxes, was that you? <laughs> Man, we gotta let her know when we're doing church every time. So King Artaxerxes gave the command to begin rebuilding, restoring, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. That was in Nehemiah's day. Uh, March 14th, 445 BC, I think. If you're note takers, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that right? Yep. So from that period of time, from that date, you start counting out 173,880 days. So that's 69 periods of seven years. A biblical year is how many days? 360 days, right? So that gives you 69 times 7, 360 days. That gives you 173,880 days. You start counting out. Boom, 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 boom. Remember the, the little kids' Christmas countdown? They got, yeah, the, the Jewish people were ripping them off, counting down. They get to the end of that period, and that just happened to be the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, declaring himself in fulfillment of numerous Old Testament prophecies as the Messiah, exactly like Daniel's prophecy declared. So in that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, uh, Daniel is told, 77s are decreed for your people. The who? The Jewish people. If the church wasn't around during the first 69 sevens, and of course the church wasn't because the church didn't exist, we're pretty safe to assume that the church isn't going to be around for the 70th. Again, time of Jacob's trouble, 77s are appointed for your people, the Jewish people. Yeah, the next one, we already did that one, right? Number four? Yep, okay. So we'll get to number five as we go. Turn to Matthew 24. Did I pray yet? Oh, man, let's pray. Lord, thanks for a warm building start over. <laughs> thanks for Scott and his humor. Lord, we're, we're blessed to be a part of your family. We're blessed to be able to, to gather together. Lord, thank you for giving us your word and your truth that we can study these things. Lord, that we don't have to be in the dark as it relates to the things that are coming. Lord, we, we may not know and we won't know the day or the hour, but we can know the times and the seasons. So help us, Lord, to be students of your word. Help us to, to unpack these things and to, to be able to just rest in knowing that, Lord, you're sovereign and you're in control. So teach us, Lord, tonight as we study. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Eighty or eight? 80, okay, big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, I I I definitely got some uh some uh exciting feedback from from Sunday. <laughs> I I wasn't surprised cuz I've talked about it before and and it always gets a uh, 
a real heated response from folks, but more than ever, I'm convinced be, because, uh, you know, there, there's such a strong opposite. I mean, I talk about all kinds of controversial topics and sin and all kinds of things, but I, I usually get the most reaction from, from talking about that one. And to me, it all comes down to that, you know, the heart, it's just the heart of the gospel, if the gospel isn't for all people, if all people can't receive the gospel, it's not good news. It's not the gospel, period. I mean, you change the gospel, and uh, that's, that's dangerous stuff. So anyway, before I get rabbit trailing on something that will make people more upset than they already are, let's talk about something else that'll make people upset. None of you guys, though. So before we dig in, we're going to read... Uh, a good chunk of Matthew 24. I want to I want to unpack this because, um, in my experience, Matthew 24 presents one of the biggest. Uh, in my opinion, it's it's taken out of context often, and that that leads to, in my opinion, arriving at a wrong uh, conclusion about the rapture. And so Matthew 24 is, is really important to understand the context of. So before we, we jump into that, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to throw something out there for you guys to pay attention to as we study through. So as Jesus is sharing what he's sharing here, there's something really important that he says, something really specific that he says in Matthew 24. It's kind of a clue that he throws out that would give the disciples the opportunity to go back after he's gone and dig into further what he's talking about here. So I want you to pay attention as we read through what that, that clue is that he throws out that would allow the disciples to go back and dig deeper on what he's talking about here, okay? Some of you already know, but we'll talk about it when we get there. So let's, let's read the first three. Jesus left first three verses. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, context, always. We always talk about context. You've got to figure out the context. Now, before we jump into this, I'm going to say, I'm going to say this. And you guys know this because we talk about it um, fairly regularly. So, the best way to interpret any passage of Scripture, or the most accurate way to interpret any passage of Scripture, is to understand what the, the, the speaker or the writer was trying to convey to the original audience, okay? If you, don't, if you don't understand that, you very often, I very often can just end up out, way out in left field, okay? To best interpret a passage of scripture, you have to find out what the original, what the author intended to convey to his audience. Does that make sense? So in order to understand that, of course, you have to understand culture, you have to understand history, you have to understand the things that were going on in that day, and, and there's a whole bunch of things that play into that, okay? So in the first three verses here, and then on through the rest of, of um, what we're going to look at tonight, who's talking? Jesus, right? Most of it, if you've got a red letter, is, is red. Who else is talking? Disciples, right? They're asking him some questions. We're, what nationality are we talking about here? Jesus and his disciples. What were they? Are you sure? Jesus wasn't American? <laughs> what are they talking about? <laughs> Specifically in verse, verses 1 through 3, what are they talking about? What's the... the Okay, so they start out in the temple, right? And they call his attention to the, the buildings and how perhaps how grand the, the temple was. Oh, Lord, look at how amazing this temple is. And then what? What did Jesus say? It's all going to get 
overturned. It's all going to get wiped out. It's all going to get destroyed. Now, of course, and we know this to be true, in, in almost all prophecy in the Bible, there's multiple layers, right? And so we know, of course, as we study history, that, that some of what Jesus is talking about here in the first three verses happened in, in A.D. 70. Rome, under Titus, came in and just, just leveled the city, leveled the temple. Jesus' prophecy here came to fulfillment. The stones were all turned over and everything was destroyed. Did Jesus, was Jesus just speaking, because some, some people would hold to this view, was Jesus just speaking about 70 AD? Was, was everything fulfilled in Matthew 24 and 70 AD? Not a chance. And we know that because we'll talk about that clue that I mentioned earlier, okay? So, <clears throat> Where are they talking geographically? In Jerusalem. Yep. And then they, of course, they're in the, they start in the temple and they end up on the Mount of Olives. So they're looking back probably on the Temple Mount. So in Jerusalem, Jews are talking. In Jerusalem. Yeah, and specifically early on about the temple. Okay, so we, we got the setting, right? That's hugely important to understand, hugely significant. Remember what we talked about in our last study, Jeremiah 30. The tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people. So context, Jews talking in Jerusalem about things that are going to pertain to Jews in the tribulation period because it's the time of Okay, so, folks, so important to understand that context, okay? Still with me? All right. Start in verse, or pick up in verse four. Jesus answered and said, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of, of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings, or the beginning, excuse me, of the birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold." but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So my personal opinion here, verses 4 through 14 are speaking of things that happened prior to the tribulation and, and after the birth of the church. So from the time that the church is born up until the tribulation period, in my opinion, verses 4 through 14 are that period of time. And you say, well, how can you say that? Because some folks would, would say that um, verses 4 through uh, 8 specifically are referring to the beginning part of the tribulation. And I would have exception with that for, for this reason, because Jesus says these are the beginning of the now, I've never had, I've never given birth. Neither have any of you men in here, and you never will, ever. But those of you who have had a child, and from what I understand, the birth pains start, but the birth pains are leading up to when the real deal happens, and that's pretty brutal, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so all these are the beginning of the and it gradually con continues and increasingly gets worse and worse until the baby's delivered, right? Now again, think back to the tribulation period. The beginning of the tribulation period, Revelation chapter 6. You can't tell me if, if uh, 4 through 8 are in fact referring to the beginning of the tribulation. You can't tell me that things aren't intense and crazy from the very, very get-go. I mean, it's, it's full-blown labor going on right there. 
So you look at what's happening here in 4 through 14. Folks, these are things that we're seeing happen. We're seeing this happen in our time. And it's going to increasingly get more and more intense as we get closer and closer to the tribulation period. Another reason I believe this is speaking of the period leading up to the tribulation is because you look at 4 through 14, and primarily the, the, the emphasis is persecution that's coming from the world onto Christians. The tribulation, though there will be persecution, of course, from the enemy onto those who get saved during that time, the, the big picture of the tribulation is not that. Because the world's been doing that since the beginning. God will not be uh, upended or uh, he, he, won't, he won't take second place during that period of time. God's wrath is going to be poured out. And as we looked at in the end of Revelation 6, the whole world knows and understands. Okay? So 4 through 14, from my opinion and in my perspective, those are things that are going on right now. And it's the world primarily focusing on the world persecuting Christians. You still with me? We, we touched on it a couple weeks ago. I, I, I don't remember who brought it up. I think uh, perhaps it was Jen, but there was, there was discussion of uh, the church being around because the gospel needed to be preached to all the nations. And of course, it, it mentions that here in verse 14. The gospel will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So, Folks will, will often um, mention that in, in this regard. The church has to be on the earth during the tribulation because if they're not, then who's going to preach the gospel, right? Which, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's a good point. But when you read the, the, about the tribulation period, it, right away in chapter 7, not right away, because it starts in 6, but in the very next chapter, chapter 7, you read about 144,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes, 12,000 from each, and these people are like Jewish Billy Grahams. I mean, they're evangelists of all evangelists, and they're preaching the gospel. Then in chapter 8, end of chapter 8, you've got eagles flying through the air proclaiming the gospel. Then in chapter 11, you've got the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, preaching the gospel. And then you've got in chapter 14, angels flying through the air. I mean, if angels are flying through the air preaching the gospel, oh, I mean, I don't see angels flying through the air preaching the gospel very often. If that's happening, oh, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty cool. And then, of course, any believer who gets saved during that period of time has at least has the opportunity to preach the gospel. So the gospel is going to be preached during that time. The church doesn't need to be here in order for the gospel to be preached. Still with me? All right. Look at verse 15. <clears throat> if I'm going too fast or if you have... I mean, we'll, we'll take time for questions at the end. So any confusions before we move on? All right, verse 15. So then you see standing, or so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down and take anything out of his house. Let no one in the field go back to, his, to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and will perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if there's, if there's been any question, and I think perhaps in some of our minds, as we've read through the first 14 verses here, uh, you could maybe say, you know, I'm not really sure where we're at in the grand scheme of things, whether we're in the tribulation period or not. But when you get to verse 15, there's no question. 
right? When you see mention of the abomination that causes desolation, you know that you're in the tribulation period, specifically in the middle of the tribulation period. Now, <clears throat> verse 15, there's a couple things that are important here. Jesus mentions who? Daniel. And there's the clue. Hugely important. Why? Who's Jesus speaking to? Did Jews know the Old Testament? <laughs> did, you, did Jews in that day know that Daniel was a prophet? Did Jews of that day know the prophecies of Daniel? Without question, right? So Jesus makes mention of Daniel the prophet here. And that is hugely significant because after Jesus is gone then, the disciples are still going to be studying and wanting to know about these things, right? What did he say there? Matthew, did you write it down? What did he say? What? And so they dig into what he said, but then they also dig into what he told them to refer to, or the, the book that he told them to refer to, the prophet Daniel. Remember what we talked about in the last study? Context, right? Jeremiah 30, the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel chapter 9, 77s are decreed for your people. So when Jesus says, let the reader understand, what's he talking about? This is probably not even a fair question because you're probably confused already. Let the reader understand. He's saying, let the person who's reading understand. Reading what? Matthew 24 and Daniel. So Jesus understands that there's going to be people during that time in the tribulation period who are going to be going back to God's word to get answers for what's going on. And they're going to read Matthew 24. <gasps> and then they're going to go back and read Daniel. When the disciples heard Jesus talk about the abomination of desolation, of course, they knew he was referring to Daniel, chapter 9 that we studied in our last study, because it's mentioned there in Daniel 9. Still with me? Okay. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Context is specific. He's speaking to Jews in what area? Judea. The hills of Judea. Verse 17. <clears throat> How often do you hang out on the roof of your house unless you're a roofer? I was on the roof actually yesterday here. <laughs> I was dealing with roof issues. But folks, we don't hang out on our roofs here. This, this has zero application for us. It it's totally doesn't even apply to us. To those people back then, most of them had... It, the, the top of their house wasn't pitched like this. It was flat. And they would go up there. They often had gardens up there. They had vines growing. They would, it was like a deck for them, the top of their house. Very, very common. Still to this day, people will go hang out on the top of their house in this part of the world. So again... Who is he speaking to, and what's the context? So important to understand. Still with me? All right, verse, verses 18 through 20. He says, pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. All of you Gentiles in here, unless somebody's here that's Jewish that I don't know about, would that matter for you and I as Gentiles? If you get sick on, so, you know, of course, Jews celebrate Sabbath on Saturday. We celebrate Sabbath on Sunday. It doesn't matter here in America. If you get sick on Saturday or Sunday, are you just out of luck or can you go to the doctor? Whenever you want, you can go to the doctor, right? Folks, even today, as I learned in our last trip, Everything shuts down on the Sabbath over there. Which is, of course, why Hamas decided to attack when they did on the Sabbath. It surprised the Jews. 
So when we were there, I got sick, and I was pretty miserable for several days and didn't really know what was going on except that I couldn't pee, which is a problem. It's good to pee. So I knew, you know, obviously something's not right, and I got fever and I got chills and had, you know, something going on in there. So finally, after several days of this, I I went to REA and I said, I think I need to go to the doctor. He said, well... It's, it's Shabbat. We, we, you, we go after Shabbat. You wait till after Shabbat. So basically just wait for the whole next day and then we'll go. <laughs> like, oh, okay. It really is a thing over there, right? Pray that your flight or pray that your prostatitis or whatever it is doesn't happen on the Sabbath because you're out of luck over there. Well, yeah, but I'm not sure that we were going to go down to that part of the world. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was pretty surprised by that. So anyway, it was uh, something that I learned firsthand over there. Context. It's, he's speaking to Jews. He's speaking to Jews in Jerusalem, in the region of Judea. The tribulation period is the time of Jacob's trouble. Context, context, context. Verses 21 through 31. So now... Obviously, we're speaking about the second half of the tribulation. And this is where the confusion comes in for folks about who's being spoken of here when it mentions the elect. So people will read this, and they'll read about the elect, and they'll say, of course the church is going to be here during the tribulation period because the elect is mentioned. So the word there for elect is eklektos, and it means chosen or elect. So now we got to figure out who he's talking about. Who are the elect that Jesus is referring to? If you're reading the NIV version of the Bible, and you look through your concordance for the word elect, this is the first place it will come up, Matthew chapter 24. Okay? And so... If you remember the rule of first mention that we've talked about, right? The first time a word is mentioned in the Bible, very often you can go back to the first place and say, this is going to give me a really good foundation to to understand what it means subsequently as it's brought up. You still with me? But if you're using the NIV, sometimes the NIV stinks, okay? If you're reading the New King James or the Old King James, you will find the word elect come up in other places, particularly in the Old Testament. So if you flip to Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 42, again, I'm going to ask you this question. I know I'm beating a dead horse here. Who is Jesus speaking to? Did Jews have the New Testament at that time? What was their frame of reference for everything that Jesus said? Old Testament. That's all they knew. That's all they had, okay? So again, we've got to understand what they were understanding as Jesus was speaking to them because that was the point. Jesus trying to explain to them the question that they asked. Tell us about the end times. Help us understand. He's he's trying to explain. So if you're reading an Old King James or a New King James, the first mention of the word elect, okay? In your New King James or Old King James concordance is going to be Isaiah Chapter 42, verse 1. Let me read this to you. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, or my chosen one, excuse me, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Who is it speaking of here? Absolutely, without question, it's speaking of Jesus. Okay, so from a Jewish perspective, when Jesus mentions in Matthew 24, the elect, here's one option that it could mean for them, Jesus. Okay, still with me? All right. Now, if you you dig into the Hebrew, the Hebrew word that's used for elect there in Isaiah 42.1, it's the word bakir. So if you, if you then 
uh, research where that word bakir is used throughout the Old Testament, there are a number of places that will pop up. So I'm going to just throw them out here. You can jot them down if you've taken notes. So <clears throat> let me go back and make sure that we're not confused. So I said, if you look up the, the word elect in your English Bible, New King James or Old King James, your concordance will bring you back the first time that it's used to Isaiah 42.1, the English word elect, right? But if you look at the Hebrew word that's used there, bakir, it's used previous to Isaiah 42.1, okay? So that's the best way to figure out where these words pop up when you look at the original language because it was written, obviously, in Hebrew, the Old Testament was. So 1 Samuel 21.6, 1 Chronicles 16, 13, I apologize, I didn't put these up there. Psalm 89, verse 3. 105, verse 6. And also verse 43. 106, verse 5. And also verse 23. So these, all that I mentioned there, are the use of the word bakir before Isaiah 42.1. So <clears throat> they're used in, in different ways, referring to different things. None of them really are um, specifically pertaining to what, as Jews, the Jewish disciples were listening to Jesus, what they would have clued in on in their minds when they heard the word elect. Okay? I don't think any of those were probably what they would have necessarily thought of. But flip to Isaiah 43. Here again, the word bakir is used. I'd try to say it with my Jewish spin on it, but I'd probably really butcher it. Bakir. Yeah. Bakir. Yeah. Isaiah 43, verse, tw verse 20. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen or elect. So it's used there again. Who is he referring to here? The Israelites, of course, my chosen people. They're my elect. They're my chosen. So now elect from a Jewish perspective, can refer to, from what they know of the Old Testament, Jesus or the Jewish people. Now, I'm going to give you these verses. You can jot them down. Isaiah 65, verse 9, and 15, and 22. So Isaiah 65 is is most often, by most um, Bible scholars, considered a passage that refers to the millennial period. Okay? So when I mention Isaiah 65, 9, 15, and 22, that word bakir is used in, in those three verses as well. And those are referring to, according to most people, millennial saints or saints followers of God in the millennial kingdom. Okay? My chosen ones in the millennial kingdom. So from a Jewish perspective, as they listen to Jesus talk and he brings up, he mentions the elect that will be in the tribulation period. More than likely, their brains go to three different places and probably just one place, in my opinion. Either it's Jesus or it's Israel or it's millennial saints. But understand this, if they're thinking of millennial saints, they're not going to think of anything other than Jews. They had no concept of Gentiles being invited in yet to be a part of the church at this point in time. They had no concept of that. So almost without question in my mind, when Jesus says elect, the disciples would never ever have thought that he's referring to the church. You know why? There was no church. The church didn't exist at that point in time. So you got to, again, you got to think about what he was saying to the original hearers and what they would have 
understood. That's the best way to interpret any passage of Scripture. The Jews, the disciples, would have zero concept of what the church was at that point in time because there wasn't a church. The church wasn't born until the day of Pentecost. Yeah. I know that's a lot to absorb. Are you still with me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think the way that the way that it reads there in Matthew 24, it it, it the idea is it's a group of people, not an individual person. So I, I don't think they would have definitely don't think they would have thought that it was Jesus. I mean, that's all the frame of reference that they had. Now, that doesn't mean to say that that um, things don't progressively don't under they don't progressively understand more and more as time goes on. But to assume that that's speaking of the church when they had no concept of the church because the church didn't exist, to me, is a huge stretch. So then I have to go back and say, okay, well, who, who's he talking about there? We already know from the previous points that we've made that there's really, really good proof that it can't be talking about the church because the church is going to be in heaven. But for the sake of discussion, we'll, we'll dig into that. So that brings us to the fifth um, pre-trib rapture proof. And contextually, and if you're doing slides, you're already there. Good job, buddy. Contextually, the disciples would never have assumed, in my opinion, that the elect in Matthew 24 was a reference to the church because the church simply didn't exist. So, you and I, of course, we have the whole Bible to look at. Now we can study the whole thing. We have Old Testament and New Testament. As you read the New Testament, over and over and over again, you see... God's people or the church referred to as the elect, without question, okay? Most of the time when you read about the elect in the New Testament, it's referring to God's people, it's referring to the church, but not always, okay? So that's where it's important to say, okay, context. Who's it talking about here? What is Jesus talking about? Let me ask you a question. If Jesus wanted to specify here in Matthew 24, again, do you think Jesus is telling them things trying to make them more confused? I'm really going to mess with these suckers. I'm going to use different words to really tweak them out and make them really confused about what I'm trying to say. Or is Jesus trying to give them as simply as he can to help them understand? Of course, any teacher would do that. So if Jesus really wanted to make sure that he was referring to the church and that they would understand and know that he was speaking of the church, why didn't he use the word ecclesia instead of the word eclectos? Doesn't make any sense to me. Jesus had previously in, in Matthew, uh, Matthew 16 Remember when he asked the disciples who the people say that I am, and Peter said, you're the, the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he said, you are Peter, and on this rock I have built my church. I will future build my ecclesia. But they didn't yet know what the church was because he said, I will. It's going to come in the future. I'm going to build my church. It starts at Pentecost, right? When the church was born. So, that's a, a, a big, you know, to me in my mind, if Jesus wanted us to know that he was speaking of the church here in Matthew 24, just use the word ecclesia, like it's used all throughout the New Testament for the church. But he uses the word eclectos or eclecton. So context, 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 context. We'll keep beating that drum. Jesus is speaking to Jews. He's speaking to Jews in Jerusalem. He's speaking to Jews who knew the custom, who knew the area. He's speaking to Jews because the tribulation is the time of Jacob's, Israel's trouble. So as you read carefully through Matthew 24, now let me step back and say, say one more thing. So I do think as you read through Matthew 24, there are 
there are parts of this that speak generally of Jewish people that are going to be alive in the tribulation period. And I think there's, there's times when it speaks more specifically about those who will be followers of Jesus, Jewish followers of believers, Jewish followers of Jesus during this time. So as you read carefully, I think you see some places where that can be differentiated. But it, again, to the disciples and what they're hearing Jesus say, when he mentions elect, I, I, in, my, in my mind, I don't, I don't think they thought anything other than that Jesus was referring to Jewish people during that period of time. And Daniel convinces me of that because he references Daniel. Seventy weeks are decreed for your people. Man, I hope I'm not confusing you guys. I know there's a lot there. I, I'm confusing myself sometimes. So Ver, verses 30 and 31, I want to I wanna zoom in on a couple things here. So 30 and 31. Uh, I skipped a few verses, didn't I? Where did I stop reading? Uh, verse 25. So let me pick up at 26. So if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east... And is visible even in the west, so will be at the, the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the heaven, from one end of the heavens to the other. So what's Jesus referring to here? This sign of the Son of Man appearing in the sky. Most often the, the, the post-trib view will hold that this is a, a reference to the rapture of the church coming at the end of the tribulation period. But uh, again, we, we look at these things closely and, and we've got to understand what's being spoken of. So when you, and I'm just going to throw these out there because you guys are familiar, familiar with them. First Thessalonians 4, of course, our, our um, 13 through 18, our rapture passage. And then 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. And that's the one that mentions in, in the flash and the twinkling of an eye will be caught up and and so, <clears throat> in both of those passages, the, the most prominent rapture passages specifically, rapture passages in the New Testament, there's no mention of other people, there's no mention of the world, there's no mentions of other nations seeing Jesus. But he mentions that here in 30 and 31. Okay? In the rapture, Jesus comes in the clouds and what happens to us? Whoop! We're caught up, right? He doesn't come down to earth. That's his second coming. His second coming, he comes down to earth and he touches down where? The Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. The rapture is not that. This is not speaking of the second coming of Jesus. Or excuse me, the rapture. Verses 30 and 31 is not speaking of the rapture. It's speaking of the second coming of Jesus, Okay? Turn to Zechariah, so those of you who, like me, forgot everything that we learned in Zechariah. I'm kidding, you didn't forget. Zechariah chapter 12. This is important because this helps us understand what Jesus is referring to there in verses 30 and 31. So the end of your, end of your New Te or Old Testament, excuse me. Zechariah chapter 12. <clears throat> we're getting close hang with me the exciting stuff is still coming look at verse uh, 10 Zechariah 12 verse 10 and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication they will look on me the one they have pierced and will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him <clears throat> 
as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great, like the weeping of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, so on and so forth. So they, on that day, will see him, and they will mourn. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about in 30 and 31, the day of his second coming, when he comes back. Then everyone will see him. Then they'll see the scars, and they'll recognize, and they'll know. And you can also cross-reference that same um, passage in Revelation 1-7. It mentions it there as well. So the rapture, does Jesus touch down on the earth? No. The church meets him in the air. And the world doesn't see him at that point. They don't see him with their eyes. We're caught up, we're with him, we see him, but the world, the nations don't see him. That happens when he comes back at his second coming. Still with me? All right. And then 32 through 35. This is a, this is a fun one. Uh, back to Matthew, sorry. Matthew 24, 32, and we'll wrap up with this. Verse 32, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, gener this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You think, well, that's kind of a weird way to end talking about all this crazy stuff that's going to happen. Why the fig tree? Well, the fig tree is nationally and historically and scripturally spoken. It, it, it's used to speak of Israel. You can see it a number of places in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, uh, Joel, Hosea speak of Israel as a fig tree, or a fig tree is used to refer to Israel. You still with me? So after the destruction of, of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Jews, it's known as the dispersion. Jews were spread out all over the world. Rome conquered them. They, they crushed them. The, maybe the last stronghold was, those of you who went to Israel, Masada, the mass suicide on, on Masada. And that, that was kind of it. The Jews are scattered everywhere. And for 2,000 years, the, the nation of Israel, it, it's a dead tree. It, it doesn't exist. They were spread all over the world. The nation of Israel ceased to exist. Of course, the people, Jewish people still existed, but there was no nation. And for centuries, there were century after century that Bible scholars would read these prophecies about Israel and they'd just scratch their heads because... There's no Israel. There's no nation. And then the Holocaust happened. And because of the Holocaust, in my opinion, the world was sympathetic towards the Jewish people. And in 1948, the, the nation of Israel was born again. It, folks, it's never, ever happened in history except with Israel. Ezekiel 37 prophesied, right? The Valley of Dry Bones. Israel was dead and done as a nation, and then it came back to life, supernaturally, miraculously. So that's what Jesus, in my opinion, is speaking of here, the budding of the fig tree, the nation of Israel coming back to life in 1948. And you say, well, who cares, Pastor Trav? Well, Jesus says that the generation that sees this will not what? The generation that sees the rebirth of the nation of Israel, the budding of the fig tree, that generation will not pass away. Folks, this should make you really excited. Because <laughs> we're in that generation right now. So you say, well, what's a generation? Well, that's where we don't really know for sure. So if you look at, and I'll just give you these so you can jot them down and look them up. Numbers 32, verse 13, and Deuteronomy 2, verse 14. Both of those references speak of a generation as 40 years, approximately. 
Genesis 15, you guys know this as the, the cutting of covenant between Abraham and, and God. And in that passage, God tells Abraham that your descendants are going to be slaves in Egypt for how many years? 400 years. And then he says, in the fourth generation, they're going to come back to the land. So in, in Genesis 15, a generation is how many years approximately? 100 years. So we've already missed the 40-year the deal from 1948. But man, we're still in that 100-year window, aren't we? So Jesus said, and, and we'll talk about this more next week, nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the Son, only the Father. But if, if, this, is, if this is true, if this is accurate, if, if Jesus is referring to Israel here as the fig tree and the budding of the fig tree is the rebirth of the nation of Israel, and I, I, I'm convinced of that, then you got 100 years from 1948. Now, think about, for those of you that have read and studied some of these things. I mean, it, it's, it's far beyond conspiracy theory anymore. The Great Reset, they've got plans, they've had plans in place for decades now for their Great Reset. And 2030 is what most of them are saying their, their goal is. Interesting <laughs> when you compare it to, to this here. I'm not suggesting that they're reading the Bible. I'm just suggesting that Perhaps God knows the timetable of how things are going to play out, right? Interesting. So, 100 years. If, if what we're saying is accurate, 2048, could it happen any time before we get outside of that 100-year window? And that brings up we're going to, what we're going to talk about next week and this is probably second only to the, the wrath issue. That, to me, is the, the biggest thing that you got to settle and figure out when you talk about the rapture of the church is, is the wrath of God being poured out in the tribulation. The next most important, in my opinion, is, is the imminent return of Christ because the pre-trib view is the only one, the only view that can say Jesus could come back at any point in time. When you read Matthew 24, we'll, we'll continue with Matthew 24 next week, and in Matthew 25, the parables that Jesus gives there. Folks, he's as intense as you can get about those who are waiting for his return and those who are like, man, whatever, no big deal. It's incredibly important to him. New Testament writers, they all believed that they were going to see the return of Christ. It was, it was an imminent thing to them. A mid-trib or a post-trib view, they can't say that Jesus could come back at any time because they're waiting for the appearing of Antichrist. You, you can't see it any other way. Their eschatology has to have Antichrist showing up first before Jesus could come back, mid- or post-trib. The pre-trib view is the only one that says Jesus could come back at any point, which is, to me, a, a really big deal that you got to work yourself through, work out. So we'll talk about that next week. I know there was a lot there tonight. Um, questions on, on any of that, <laughs> if you're still awake. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, fire. Yeah. Well, and, and maybe that's what the trigger was for Matthew <laughs> when he heard that to start writing it down. You know, he was probably already writing it down, but maybe that, wait, what? Maybe the reader? Somebody needs to write this stuff down. Yeah. Well, it, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> well, and then you. You think about um, what we talked about a few weeks ago when we, we mentioned you know, how um, 
the gospel is going to be able to go out to the whole world. But you, you see what's available now with technology and with cell phones. I mean, you go to the poorest nations on earth and people have cell phones. And, I mean, the, the speed that information can travel and what people have access to in terms of being able to hear the gospel on their, their phones, I mean, it's unprecedented. So there, there's a whole lot that, uh, you know, at, of course, as time goes on, we're able to, to, to catch more and more of a glimpse of, wow. Uh, <laughs> there was a whole lot back then that, that they didn't, the puzzle pieces just weren't there in so many regards, but now we're seeing more and more of it just as time goes on. Everything's fitting in. So, good thought. Any other questions? Oh, uh, yeah, let me get my eyeballs adjusted here. There he is out in the desert, now gone. Oh, uh, lightning comes. Wherever the carcass is, there the vultures were gathered. And immediately, um, well, my first thought would be, uh, you know, the end of the tribulation period, right, when Jesus comes back on his white horse and the sword that comes out from his mouth deals with all of his enemies, and you read about what Revelation says will happen there. <laughs> There's a big feast. The birds of the air feasting on the, the bodies of the enemies of God. So uh, I, I've always taken it as uh, a reference to that. You know, I think personally as we get down there towards, um, you know, the end of that section that we've read, particularly there in verse 28, it's, it's speaking of the end of the tribulation period. Yeah, and that's probably the one I just referenced, but let me make sure. 1917, yeah. Come, gather together for the great supper of God, verse 18, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and generals and mighty men of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. Yeah, an invitation to the birds of the air to come and gobble up eyeballs and other stuff too. Other questions? And I hope I didn't thoroughly confuse folks tonight. I know we went really fast. I, I don't ever mean to imply that you guys are anything less than intelligent and bright, but I know this can be... You know, you're going through your Rolodex of things you've already learned, and um, that's just a lot to process. So don't feel bad if you have questions. Yeah. You know, um, I've done it twice now. We've taught through Revelation twice, um, and I, I love Revelation. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think about it often. I, I just don't know if people would get, uh, like, oh, my goodness, we're doing it again. Because it takes me, like, almost three years to get through it. I think, yeah, I'm sure we have it. Yeah, we could we could see if we could track that. All. We've recorded it all, so yeah. The the second time around would probably be better than the first. <laughs> but yeah, I don't remember what years we did them, but we've gone through the whole book twice. It was fun. We might do a, you know, after we finish this, we might do a, a Gog and Magog study, which would be fun, Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine, because that plays significantly into things that are going on right now, in my opinion. So, yeah.
Yeah. What was that verse again in Luke 17? Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, so if you look um, just a little bit before that, you see uh, Jesus mentioned verse 30, it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who let no one who was on the roof of his house go and... I mean, it's saying a lot of the same things that, Matt, like you said, Matthew 24 did. So when it mentions the, the day of the Son of Man being revealed, that to me is speaking of Jesus returning. And like we read in Revelation there um, in 19, when he comes back, that's when the sword of his mouth and the birds gather. So that would fit for sure with that same, that same timetable. And yeah. 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 Well, and you know, the language is, is sobering. Um, in those those passages where you know Matthew 24 and then the corresponding in, in Mark and Luke where Jesus talks about the end times because uh, these these false prophets false Christs will deceive even the elect if that were possible you know so so those who um, again are followers of his in that time um, it's going to be a strong deception. It's already a strong deception, right? We, we've seen that for, for decades and centuries. But the, the deception continues to be more and more pronounced, I think, as time goes on. Yeah. You're in trouble, yeah, yeah. Well, and and that's another interesting, interesting thing is as you consider, um, particularly Matthew 24 and and what Jesus is saying there and who he's saying it to. There's a lot of reference there to the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah, which you know the the Jewish people are still looking for their Messiah. They're not convinced that it was Jesus, right? And so that deception is going to be particularly, uh, it's going to trip them up. Those who are born again, we have no question about waiting for another Messiah because we know who the Messiah is. So that lends further to that idea that it's, it's, it's focused on the Jewish people, you know. Um, so, yeah, man, there's, there's a whole lot there we, we could take weeks and weeks to unpack Matthew 24. Yeah, okay. <laughs> other other questions? Yeah, Chase. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and, and that's a great point that you brought up because there are certainly other um, ideas about what a generation is. 40 and 100 are the most common that you'll hear, but that, that verse is referenced, obviously. And so uh, to me, the point of all that, and, and it's good that you even brought that up, if we really understand what's being taught, particularly in Matthew 24 and 25, the, without question, Jesus' emphasis is be ready. Be ready. Be ready, because it could happen at any point, which is exciting. If I'm mid-tribber or post-tribber, eh, can't happen yet. The Antichrist has to show up first. not looking for Jesus Christ, you're looking for Antichrist. It's kind of a scary deal. Yeah. Any more? That Israel has already found their Messiah? Is that what you said? Yeah? Yeah. 
Well, unfortunately, I think most of them are still, are still looking. Jesus came to be their Messiah, but they didn't accept him. They rejected him. So you're right, their Messiah did show up, but most of them don't believe that it was, that it was Jesus. Pretty sad, huh? <laughs> I got to pay attention over there. You guys are paying attention over there. I like that. All right, any more? All right, let's pray it up. Lord, thanks for another chance to dig in. Thankful for, Lord, how much your word gives to us and how much it, it makes clear and explains to us. And, and Lord, as the days continue to get uh, darker and, and crazier in this world, Father, we just pray that, that you would give us your perspective, Lord, increasingly, that we would have your heart, that we would be able to rightly divide, Lord, not, not only your word, but also the, just understanding the, the times and seasons that we're living in, that we would have, uh, Lord, the urgency that you desire for us to have, that we would be living our lives in light of your return, Lord, that it could be any day. And we, we thank you so much, Lord, for the hope that one day we will be with you forever. So, Lord, continue to teach us, help us to, to just have a passion to continue to dig into your word. And, we, Lord, we just love you and thank you so much. In Jesus' name.